I guess because I had the time sitting on the bench like I was, they started to talk to me. I became kind of the unofficial team chaplain. They never would have happened if I hadn't gotten hurt. Not being able to play never got easier. I really wanted to be out there, but I had actually discovered the joy that the Bible talks about. Right after I got hurt, I would have told you that my injury had ruined my life. Now, I can actually thank God for how He used it. Difficulties are part of this life. At times, we will face storms, whether literal or figurative. Most of us probably already accept the reality of suffering in this life. This message is not so much focused on the reality of suffering, but that which is of the utmost importance, our response to suffering. The question, how do you handle hardship? Hardship will militantly force its way into our life. And even when we are on a good path, even when we're doing the right things, suffering just shows up. The question is, how do you respond to it? Ultimately, we're in the book of James and we understand the overarching theme in the book of James is faith in action. Having a faith that works. James tells us it's not just about talking the talk, but it's also walking the walk. James makes it very clear that true and genuine faith will always be accompanied by good works. James is not elevating our behavior above our beliefs, but James reminds us that with genuine belief, there is good behavior. Today we're going to focus on how we can demonstrate the genuineness of our faith by how we handle hardship. James starts at the first part of his epistle really out of the gates hard with a, a statement that is almost uh, difficult to imagine at times. He writes differently than Paul. Paul would often write the first half of his epistle with theology and then the second half with practical application. But James starts off right from the gate with a very powerful exhortation. And this chapter, what we will look at in more detail in your life groups, is really focused on how that we handle hardship. So let's take a look. If you have a copy of God's Word, we are going to be in James. Uh, James, towards the end of the New Testament, we're going to be starting in chapter 1. So as you are able, and as you found the place, would you stand with me as a demonstration of respect for the reading of God's holy, written, inerrant Word. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produced steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Would you pray with me? Father, no doubt in this room, there are people carrying the heavy mantle of hardship. Lord, I, I just go around and greet people, and many of them are going through a storm right now. Father, we realize, just as Jesus told us, in this life we will have trouble. But Father, my prayer is, that you'd help us understand how to handle hardship as a demonstration of the genuine faith that I tr trust we have. In this, Lord, I pray that you'd be glorified as you lead us. 
because we ask it in Christ's name. And God's people said, How do you handle hardship? Now, it's important for me to say the question of how you handle hardship is not meant to shift your attention to the past as much as we can look to the past to answer that question. The question that I ask you of how you handle hardship is much more important directed towards the future. In a practical sense, what can you do to make sure that you go through trouble in a positive way? That's what James is telling us. Very practical knowledge of how we handle hardship. And the first thing that he really tells us is when hardship comes into your life, when you are met at the door with suffering, what does he say to do? Count it all joy. Really? I mean, you know, just when the bomb is dropped and you just see all this difficulty in your life and then all of a sudden you're reminded of this phrase, count it all joy. You're like, really? Well, first, James is not saying that we should be masochistic, that we should enjoy pain and suffering. He's not saying uh, that the pain is not real. He's not saying that your suffering is not a big deal. What he's saying is, even when difficulty comes, there is still reason to remain positive. Really, this is the main idea I want you to get from this, and I wrote this across the top of your page, inside your bulletin. I need to stay positive when the problems start. How do you handle hardship? When the problem starts, remember, stay positive. Now, as we're talking about staying positive, we see that James is first talking about our attitude, that we need to have a positive attitude. So many times when hardship comes, we just start thinking about all the problems. We start thinking all the difficulty, and we can get very negative. Don't do that. James is saying Not that we look at our problem and say, oh, I love my problem. It's such a cute little problem. He's not saying that. He's saying in your problem, you can focus on what's good, not what's bad. I wrote it down this way. Point number one, I must change my perspective on suffering. I must change my perspective on suffering because the joy we find in our problems is not because we enjoy the problem, but we know even with an unpleasant experience that God has promised to do good. That although I may not like what I have to face, I know by faith God can bring good from that. Even Beyond the recognition that God can take the worst circumstances and bring good, we have to understand that God thinks of difficulty differently than we do. We times, at times, will look at a problem and we just clearly label it bad. So when it comes into our life, we only think, well, that's bad. But can God help you understand that sometimes the problems in your life are designed to make you better, not bitter. Ultimately, God does not always cause your problem, but God who is sovereign has allowed it. And the thing that we have to realize, the change in my mind, if God who is loving, if God who cares for me allowed it into my life, I got to know he's got a good reason for it. That God has a good reason to allow the difficulty in my life. Now, ultimately, uh, we'll be looking at many different ways in which a bad thing can be good. We're going to talk about more of that in your life groups. Uh, But ultimately, 
in this passage, we see that there is at least one really good reason why we need to change how we think about the problems in our life. You see, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Why? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So the the first thing I have to realize, if God has allowed it into my life, I've got to realize that this is an opportunity for a test. And everybody said, yay. All right, well, I wrote it down this way. Point A, letter A under point number one, God will test my faith. That's not the only reason God allows problems. Sometimes problems bring humility. Sometimes problems bring me closer to God. But one of the things, if God allows it into my life, it is an opportunity for my faith to be tested. Now here's the question. Who benefits from a test? Uh, We honored teachers last week because teachers are awesome. The question to teachers Who benefits when you give a test? We would obviously assume that the students are going to be improved by that, but also the teachers are improved. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was in seminary, and one of my classes had a fairly new professor. And this professor was not one for preparation as such. I mean, he had loads of information. So he'd just walk into class and say, hey, where'd we leave off last time? Somebody'd say something, he'd off he'd go. There'd be a question, off he'd go. Then time would run out and he'd dismiss the class. That was class every time. But when it came to the test, almost no one passed. And he's standing before the class and he's saying, guys, I don't understand. Everyone in here failed the test. So I put my hand up. What you had on the test was not only not in the textbook for what you assigned us to read, but it's nothing that you even talked about. And and, and he's like, really? And everybody's like, yeah. So he looks at me and he says, okay, before our next test, you need to email me your notes. which I'm okay with because then I knew whatever was on the test was also in my notes. <laughs> but I wasn't the only one that came to that epiphany because after class, I had many people come up to me and say, oh, by the way, can you send me your notes as well? <laughs> and they just didn't even take notes anymore. But here's the point. Testing can be beneficial for a teacher if the teacher is not perfect. God is. As God is the perfect teacher, he is not benefited by the test, but we are. When a test comes into our life, God allows it there so that we can see where we're at in our faith. It's a good opportunity for us because we can all walk the walk when the walk is easy. We can all put on a nice face when things are going well, but it is in the depths of difficulty our faith is really shown for how strong it is. Testing of our faith is a good thing. Whether you like the test or not, we know that testing our faith is good. And I'll I'll ask you, if you go through in your mind the periods in your life where you really grew in your relationship with God. If you were to just kind of check the periods in your life that you really just had leaps and bounds in your spiritual growth, I'll tell you, more often than not, in those points in your past, you were either getting ready for suffering or you were in the middle of suffering. Because it is in the depths of of our difficulty that we really learn to hit our knees. It is in the big storm that everybody starts praying. And God uses difficulties. Now, one tool you need in order to change your perspective 
on how difficulty can be good, James tells us that there is something that we need. Look again in the text. In James, he says, hey, it's a test of our faith. It's okay. It's a good thing. But then what he says in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without approach, and it will be given to him. So what is the thing that I need in order to have a better perspective on difficulty? Wisdom is what I need. And God says, ask me for it. I wrote it down this way under letter B in your notes. I can ask God for wisdom. I can ask God for wisdom. If you have a problem in understanding how the difficulty in your life can be used for good, we can come to God and say, God, I really need some wisdom here because this just stinks. Now, ultimately, I want to be clear. Many times we come to God and we're coming to him with the simplest of questions that comes in just three letters. And when we think we're asking for insight, sometimes God doesn't answer that question. And what is the big question with three small letters? Why, God? That's not what I'm talking about. God's not saying if you want to understand why, if you want the reason, just ask. It's not wrong to ask. But God may not always tell us why. Ultimately, even if he did, we probably wouldn't think it would be a good reason. He says, all right, this is why. You say, really? That's not a good reason. So ultimately, it is not so much that we come to God with that question, why? But the understanding that God gives us is that even though there is difficulty, I can understand that good is coming. That God is in control and He is a loving God. And because of that, I have that wisdom to know that this is not the end. It's going to be all right. Turn to somebody near you and say, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. And it is through wisdom that allows me to put my confidence in God's providence. It is through wisdom that helps me realize all things work together for good. Even this day, the problems in your life, God can bring good from it. It is through wisdom that I can come and look past my problems and realize the possibilities. I can get past the difficulty and ultimately I can realize that there's good coming. So that's the attitude. That's the positive attitude I must have. But James goes on in this chapter and he doesn't just talk about being positive with the right attitude. He then says part of being positive, part of staying positive when the problem starts is the fact I've got to have the right actions as well. Now what are some common actions in response to problems that are not right, by the way? Denial. Sadness, anger, disappointment, worry, bitterness. There's all these things that can come, and not just an attitude the way we think, but an action. So James moves from having the right attitude, the right thinking, to the right action. So the question is, when problem comes in your life, do you just stop and whine and complain? No. Because the Bible says, do all things without complaining. Oh. Now, we say, well, I just get really, really mad. Anger not being a sin, but James tells us that anger has a speed limit. 
slow to anger. And not only that, but there are times when what I say when I'm in a problem is not good. That's why James says in James chapter 1, anyone who thinks they're a religious person but does not control their tongue, your religion is useless. So what I have to realize in James chapter 1 is that even though problem comes, I need to stay positive not just in my attitude but also in my actions. I wrote it down this way for point number two in your notes. I can choose the path without sin. The problem starts Right there, when the problem starts, you need to realize, okay, it's, I've got to have this attitude that's right. But I also, whatever I do from the time the problem comes in my life, needs to also be right. Your temptation to fly off the handle. The temptation uh, to return in kind. Those are things that James is telling us that we should not do. Take a look in James chapter 1 verse 12. He says it this way. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. In other words, the right, the right attitude is always followed by the right action. And when I'm able to behave the right way beyond just the way I think, God is pleased with that. Now ultimately what some people might say, and I don't know if you've said this, you know, I would have a whole lot less of a problem of shooting off my mouth or doing something stupid if I just didn't have this problem in my life. And that's probably true. If life was a bed of roses, we probably wouldn't lose our temper much. Maybe. So some might think, well, God, if you allowed this problem into my life, and because of it I'm tempted to do something stupid, can I blame you for my temptation? What does James say? James 12 he says, blesses the man who remains steadfast under trial. Then verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So I wrote this down under point number two. God won't tempt me with evil. God will test you. God will allow trials but he does not tempt you. What's the difference? A temptation is an enticement to evil. A trial or a test is an opportunity for growth. God allows trials. God brings tests so that I would be better. Temptation, on the other hand, entices us to be worse. See the difference? Now, ultimately, God never tempts us. And you say, okay, if God never tempts us, where does my temptation come from? Look back in the text. Let no one say, verse 13, he was, when he's tempted, I'm being tempted of God. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. So who do I blame for my temptation? My three best friends, me, myself, and I. Ultimately, when I am tempted, I can't say God did that. But I am tempted by my own desires. And the term there is really a fishing term. That you are lured away and enticed by your desires. You know, uh, I've done some fishing. I'm not a great fisherman. Some of you are. But one thing I've learned in fishing, you don't catch much without bait. 
You know, I'll be there sitting there in the pole, and I'll reel it up, and there'll be a bare hook. And I think to myself, I must be going for the stupid one or the suicidal one. Because fish just don't bite bare hooks. We do not realize, but sin, we do understand, is bad. Like a bare hook, we're not just going to jump and do sin, but we are enticed to do it. We are lured by our own desires. So it is true when problems come into our lives that we need to make sure our actions are right. And what we need to realize is that any temptation that comes is not from God. Now why is that so important? Why do I need to know that the importance of right actions is based on the temptation never comes from God? Why is that so important? Because when I need someone to help me through temptation, it helps a whole lot that I know God didn't cause it. And I can ask Him to see me through it. I wrote it down this way, letter B. I should ask for God's strength. I should ask for God's strength in temptation. I grew up in Indiana, most of you probably know. My father was lifetime military, and we grew up, uh, one of the places we lived was right side out of an army base. And my dad sometimes would take us shooting on the army base. And me and my brother, we loved that. One particular time, I think it was about 10 or 11 years old, and we were shooting a couple of pistols, and then in a lane not too far from us, somebody set down an M60. You know what an M60 is? It's a huge machine gun. It's capable of 500, 600 rounds per minute. Shoots a 30 caliber ammunition, uh, usually belt fed. In the army, not one person, but usually it was a crew weapon that required two if not three people because this big machine gun was so big. And I look over at this big machine gun and I say, Dad, I want to shoot that. So he goes over and he talks to the guys for a little bit and then he waves us over. And uh, he had made a deal with these two people that both myself and my brother could shoot a 100-round belt in the M60. So he looks at us and says, who's first? I'm like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> and he looks at me and he says, Andy, make sure you spoon it. I didn't know what he meant. But he said, do you understand? I'm like, yeah, I understand. Now, you know, I, I think about that later, and I'm thinking he wasn't necessarily telling me to cuddle it softly like I would my wife or to spoon. No, uh, what I didn't realize is that was its, some important instructions. But when I got a hold of this M60, it was sitting on a shooting tape. I grabbed it, and I held on. Again, 100 rounds is about a 10-second ride. But if you can imagine shooting a 30 caliber rifle 100 times in 10 seconds... That's a lot. And so as I was shooting it, it was pushing me off the whole table. That was probably one of the reasons why I said spoon it, meaning just shoot and burst. Uh, but I almost came off the table, and if I had, I probably would have held on to it, spraying ammo everywhere. It would have been bad. But my dad, he came up behind me, and he supported me. Probably for his own preservation of life, but certainly... <laughs> But here's the thing. I didn't know how bad it was going to be when I grabbed hold of that. Because of it, a lot of things could have gone wrong. But my dad was close. And he stepped in. That's the way temptation can work. When I get to a situation and all of a sudden it's a lot bigger than what I thought. I can say, God, you know, I need your help. Give me strength not to do something stupid. And that's what we understand. Because when the problem starts, we need to stay positive. That's the main thing I want you to get. By way of review, when the problem starts, I need to always stay positive. You say, how do I do that? That's what we're talking about. First, I must change my perspective on suffering. It's not natural to rejoice in a problem, but when we change our perspective, we can realize that good can come even from the bad. 
And one of the ways that I can get good in my life is because God is testing my faith. I wrote it down under point number one, letter A. God will test my faith for my benefit. And when I'm trying to change my perspective, one instrument that I need is wisdom. Letter B, I can ask God for wisdom. Secondly, part of staying, pro- staying positive is not just the right attitude, but also the right actions. And I wrote it down this way. I can choose the path without sin. When problems come, I can just stop and realize that the next thing I do needs to not be something stupid. Now, ultimately, I can realize that God will never tempt me. Letter A under point number two, God will tempt me with evil. And that's good to know because when I am being tempted, I can always come to him and say, God, I need your help. I should ask for God's strength, let her be. As I close, we see practical advice in James 1 on how that we handle problems. One thing that we have to understand is a good reason why we should do it the right way. One good thing that I need to realize, you know, I respond to problems in my life in a way that is not good, then why should I choose to respond in a way that is good? Well, this passage gives us at least one reason. There are several reasons why, but I think one of the interesting ones, again, is in James 1.12. Blessed or happy is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who, who love him. Last thing I wrote down in your notes. God is sincerely pleased when I can stay positive. God is sincerely pleased when I can stay positive. And there is a crown that comes with that. Now, I don't know what you're going through, and I may not know the extent But God gives us some real good tips on how we can handle hardship. Let's pray about that. Father, we do thank you that we can come to you even in our difficulty. But Father, I just pray as we reflect on how we've handled hardship in the past, that Lord, we would look towards the future. And we would make the decision that you are placing on our hearts so that we might Stay positive when the problem starts. Lord, I pray that you'd guide our hearts. There there needs to be decisions made. And Lord, I just pray that the decisions made today would bring you great, great glory. That you would be pleased as we choose this path. In this, Lord, I pray that you give us strength to respond according to your will. Because we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.